Malala, Activist for Girls' Education, written by Rafael Freer, illustrated by Ariela Franti. Malala is born at dawn in 1997. She is the first child of Zaidin Yosuvasi and Torek Pekai. They live in the large city of Mingora, which spreads out across the depths of the Swat Valley in Pakistan. Their home is across the street from a school for girls that Zayuddin founded, the Kushal School. Malala's father is not sorry that his child is a girl, as some new fathers in their country might be. Ziyardin is very fond of his Pashtun people, but he is not as fond as of some of their traditions. Ziyadin asks friends and family to throw dried fruits, candy, and coins into her cradle, as they would for a boy. Malala grows up with the smell of notebooks in the air. It doesn't take long for her first little brother to arrive. He is named Kushal, like his father's school. The two children run together in the classrooms after school is over or play hide-and-seek with neighbors. They fly kites on the rooftop and try to touch the sky. Malala and Kashil look out to the city toward Mount Ilum, where the snow never melts. Malala loves her grandfather's village, way up in the mountains, far from the pollution of Mingora. There, the water in the lakes and waterfalls is pure, the nuts are abundant, and the honey is delicious. In the winter, people make snow bears, but Malala does not love all the village stories, like the one about Shahida, who was sold to an old man for marriage. In the Pashtun mountains, even more than the city, men are the ones who are visible in society and the workplace, while women stay at home and must obey the men. Most women, like Malala's mother, cannot read or write. Lala likes to climb up the, on the roof at home in Mingora so she can listen to the sounds of the city, the chatter of the birds, and the words of her father talking about politics with his friends while they drink cardamom tea. They talk about how the Taliban, a powerful and violent political group, has set another school on fire. The Malala's, Malala's father and his friends hate that the Taliban want students to study strict, very conservative interpretations of the Quran. They call the Taliban an ignorant group and worry that it will cause terrible problems. Ziadin often shares ideas with his daughter. Malala knows that she is lucky to have thoughtful parents. Her mother loves a Pashto song that goes like this. Don't kill doves in the garden. You kill one and the others won't come. Malala thinks about what this means. A terrible earthquake shakes the, village, the region on October 8, 2005. The mountain villages are reduced to dust. Soon afterward, Malala realizes that her father is worried about something else too. A man named Fazlulal, who is in charge of the nearby Taliban, scares Ziyadin. Fazlulal wants to, to close Ziyadin's school, his school for girls. Fazlulal takes advantage of people's sadness about the earthquake. Time and time again, through his local radio station, he tells them that their sins caused the earthquake. He tells them to stop listening to music and watching movies. He says this will make everything better. Malala's father is heartbroken. He rejects the use of religion to threaten freedom. But people worry, what if Fazula is telling the truth? Fear settles in the valley. Some people throw their televisions, computers, CDs, and other belongings into fires. But the Taliban insists that even more needs to be done. People stop dancing. Beauty parlors close. Men stop shaving because the Taliban requires that beards are worn. Women's bodies and faces are covered by burqas, long cloth garments that flow from head to toe. The pal of Taliban is on patrol. Taliban members arrest people who disobey them and whip or kill people if they resist the new rules. Zayuddin is afraid, but he dares to disagree. He allows Malala to speak out against the Taliban in a September 2008 speech covered by newspapers and television stations. There, 
She asks, how dare the Taliban take away my basic right to education? She is only 11 years old. As 2008 ends, the Taliban announces another ban. Girls no longer have the right to go to school as of January 15th, 2009. How can they stop us from going to school? Malala is upset. Her friends are angry too. They have already blown up hundreds of schools and no one has done anything. Then an opportunity arrives. Malala is recruited to write about girls and education. Her first blog post, written under the pseudonym Gul Makai, appears on the British Broadcasting Corporation's website. Diary of a Pakistani Schoolgirl, Saturday, January 3rd, 2009. I am afraid. I had a terrible dream yesterday with military helicopters and the Taliban. Malala's words do not stop the Taliban. The group goes farther north and uses even more violence. Soon there are peace agreements between the Pakistani government and the Taliban, but the agreements don't work in the end. The Taliban continues to use violence against the people. Then tanks and guns arrive in the valley. It is war. Malala and her family abandon their house and travel to the village where her grandparents live. They stay in four cities over three months before they can return home. Mingora is again in ruins, but the Taliban has been driven away. Schools are rebuilt so everyone can study, even girls. Malala wants everyone to get an education. Malala is elected Speaker of the Child Assembly associated with Kapal Gore Foundation, which promotes the rights of children. In this leadership role, she begins as a children's rights activist. But soon, the Taliban returns to the valley. Schools are destroyed again. Supporters of freedom are executed. Malala doesn't get discouraged. Although she is not yet 14, she is already an important person in her country. She continues to write her blog and fight for girls' right to an education. Malala is often invited to speak and receives lots of assistance for her campaign. The Pakistani government awards her the first ever National Youth Peace Prize. By 2011, Malala is so successful, she is able to create an educational foundation. It helps her and those who support her work. But her family is threatened by the Taliban. The militant group does not like her father's schools or Malala's activism. On October 9, 2012, Malala is riding home on the school bus. It stops suddenly. A man shouts to the driver, Is this the Kuchul school bus? A second man enters the bus and yells, Who's Malala? Nobody answers, but some students look at their friend. It is obvious who Malala is. She is the only one who has taken off her headscarf on the bus. One of the men shoots Malala three times. Everyone screams. Two other girls are hurt. Malala sumps forward into her best friend's lap. The bus driver speeds to the nearest hospital in sweat. The Pakistani president, along with other politicians and famous Muslims, condemns the assassination attempt. The Taliban claims responsibility. Malala is not doing well. Her father wishes out loud that he could take her place. The doctors and government decide to accept an offer for Malala to be treated at a hospital in Birmingham, England. Malala must go alone because it is too dangerous for her father to leave her mother and brothers alone in Pakistan. She is confused when she awakes in England, but she speaks on the phone to her parents. Finally, her family arrives. Letters and gifts are sent from all over the world. After several operations and a lot of time to heal, Malala takes classes in Birmingham. The Taliban doesn't silence Malala. She keeps fighting for education rights. There are more than 5 million children in Pakistan who don't have the right to go to primary school. Most of them are girls. Malala empathizes with young girls in other countries, such as Afghanistan, Nigeria, and Nepal, who live where education for girls isn't valued. Many people believe that women should stay at home to watch the younger children, cook, do housework, and get water from the wells. Girls are often required to marry at a very young age. Many families believe that only boys should have jobs. Malala disagrees with all of these ideas.
On Malala's 16th birthday, July 12th, 2013, hundreds of people from around the world hear her speak at the United Nations in New York City. Malala wears a shawl that belonged to Benazir Bhutto, a Pakistani prime minister who was assassinated. I am here to speak up for the right of education of every child. I want education for the sons and daughters of the Taliban and all the terrorists and extremists. She speaks about Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, and Mahatma Gandhi. Poverty, ignorance, injustice, racism, and the deprivation of basic rights are the main problems faced by both men and women. She speaks about women's rights and girls' education. There was a time when women social activists asked men to stand up for their rights, but this time we will do it by ourselves. Malala puts hope and hearts and tears in eyes. One child, one teacher, one pen, and one book can change the world. The next year, Malala receives the Nobel Peace Prize. At 17, she's the youngest person ever to receive the prestigious award. But the beautiful Swat Valley, where pomegranate and fig trees bloom, still isn't free. Malala and her family can't go home because they are under death threats. Weapons still rule. Shots ring out along with bombs from drones. Fighting results in victims on both sides, sometimes innocent victims. Malala talks with the President of the United States about the situation with the hope that peace will triumph quickly in Pakistan. Malala dreams of books and notebooks instead of war in her beloved valley. The Nobel Peace Prize gives Malala wings. She visits Syrian refugee camps in Lebanon. She supports school projects in Nigeria and more. Malala has been known worldwide ever since the United Nations designated July 12, 2013, her 16th birthday as Malala Day. The day celebrates that every child should have the right to go to school, to learn to write and count, to know the happiness of reading freely. The end. We can learn more about Yal Malala Yousafzai. For her, learning is a universal right. Here's an excerpt from her speech to the United Nations in New York on July 12, 2013. Dear sisters and brothers, we realize the importance of light when we see darkness. We realize the importance of our voice when we are silenced. In the same way, when we were in Swat, the north of Pakistan, we realized the importance of pens and books when we saw the guns. Here's another excerpt from when she learned she received the Nobel Prize. I dedicate this award to all those children who are voiceless, whose voices need to be heard. We can learn more about Malala, her people, and her country. Here is a timeline of Malala's life from when she was born, July 12, 1997, to when she won the Nobel Peace Prize, October 10th of 2014, as well as some information about Malala's country, Pakistan, and the Pashtun people. We can also learn more about girls in school. We, to hear about the alarming situation for girls in Pakistan, as well as education in the world around us. Furthermore, we can learn some about what Malala and her and religion. Care to learn more about Malala's inspiration? You can read here about her, mo the most important historical figures that she found inspiration from, such as Gul Mukai, Malalai, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, and Martin Luther King Jr. You can also hear more of Malala's famous words. Here are some excerpts from various speeches 
and publications that she has had, as well as places that you can look up more information about Bunlala, her story, her speeches, and her message.